Hey everyone, Brian Goulet here of GouletPens.com and this is episode number 215 of Goulet Q&A and I'm celebrating with this epic Trans-Siberian Orchestra shirt. I'm just kidding. I wore this actually. We had a, a special visitor come today who I know is a rocker so I wore one of my rockin' t-shirts and uh, it was much appreciated. Didn't really think about the fact that I'd be wearing it all day long. Could have brought a different shirt, but didn't. So anyway, we're rocking out together. I've seen Trans-Siberian Orchestra twice live and it was Fantastic. Anyway, um, just finished up Father's Day. My kids made me cards. They were completely adorable. I did not think to bring them in, but just imagine how adorable a six and eight year old's Father's Day card could be. Uh, it involved unicorns, rainbows, Pokemon, you name it. Um, and then they bought me a couple of very interesting gifts, one of which was a string of LED poop emoji lights as well as some silly socks. The one that looked like an American flag and another one that had popsicles all over it. So silly kind of dress socks, which is fun because whenever I wear a suit or something, I always feel kind of ridiculous anyway. Not that I, you know, I'm, I guess I'm more comfortable in stuff like this than I am this suit. But anyway, when I wear a suit, I always just feel like I need to have a little bit of my silliness in there. So I try to wear ridiculous socks when I do it. Maybe I'm not the only one. And then the other thing was up here, um, right right here, got this sweet mug, which I'll go ahead and show you, um, that Rachel got me, king of dad jokes. Very appropriate. And actually, it's printed on both sides, so no matter which, which you get to see it, I get to see it, it's pretty cool. Not all mugs do that, so that's kind of fun. So I'm gonna kind of put that up there because uh, I do love me the dad jokes. Uh, anyway, Let's talk about pens, shall we? So we got a whole bunch of things that are coming. You know, we just finished up our website a couple of weeks ago and we are in the process of, you know, still kind of fixing some things. Um, even like as I'm shooting this, we're having some issues taking orders and stuff like that. That's a global Shopify thing. Anyway, that'll be fixed by Friday. You better believe it by the time this video publishes, but as of Wednesday, that's happened for a couple hours. So there's like things here and there that are happening just, things that drive us crazy like that. But um, there's lots of other things that we've been working on, things that have been on hold through the website, uh, new products and, and things such as this. So we've got a lot that's in the works. Um, we probably held back a little bit and we got some other new things that are being pushed out, other things coming in. It's kind of just normal fare for us, but uh, I got some fun stuff to share with you. So um, let's see here. First off, we have um, some Conklin uh, pens which uh, now have the flex nibs on them, the OmniFlex. Uh, I grabbed just a herringbone off the shelf, but I wanted to show you the OmniFlex nib. Let's see if we can get the autofocus going here. There we go. Andy and I have been messing around with the autofocus trying to get it to work. Uh, but anyway, it's got the same shape nib as what's on the Duraflex, or what was on the Duraflex. The Duraflex are all gone now, um, but we were able to work out getting some nibs on some regular Conklin pens, so it's not all pens, but I think it's most of them except for the Brownstone, uh, all American, which requires a black nib and we're currently out of the black. Well, anyway, <laughs> it's a whole thing. Um, they're having a shortage of these nibs right now, kind of in transition, you know, just typical manufacturer type stuff, you know, in between uh, transitioning some things over and whatnot. So the nibs are a little wacky right now on Monteverde and Conklin. We're working through some of that. Um, and part of what we're doing there is we're actually worked out something with them to be able to put some of our Goulet nibs on some of their pens. So that's why you might see some of them um, like this um, Conklin Nozak. It's got a Goulet nib on it. This is the 70th anniversary Israel edition. So um, you may see some of the pens that we have available with Goulet nibs on there. We've had pens like the Monteverde Northern Lights and the, um, the Regatta and then the uh, Nebula. So we're trying, we're trying to offer some stuff while nibs are in transition there, but uh, they're working on it and uh, things should smooth out there uh, in July is what we're told, but we shall see. Uh, other things that have been coming out, so we had uh, Opus 88 is a relatively new brand that I've talked about a few times. We've done a little bit in right now, um, but it's uh, eyedropper fill pens and I'll just grab a couple of them. Um, there's the Coloro and the Picnic. So these are kind of cool pens, you know, in the sub hundred dollar range. And then I've actually been using the clear Coloro as well, which is really kind of a whole different pen than the regular Coloro. I got mine filled up with uh, Diamond Ancient Copper right now. Woo! I dropped a fill pen, huge ink capacity, Yovo nibs. So nice writing pens and they've been pretty popular so far. So that's kind of cool. Well, actually, as it turns out, one another newer brand that we've carried, Colorverse, and um, Opus 88 did a little collaboration. So Colorverse made some ink to match some of the Opus 
88 pens, which is kind of cool. So we just got those inks in and launched them this week. So you can check those out. They're pretty darn cool, very vibrant colors. And of course they match the pens, so that's neat. And then we also launched our summer edition Edison Nouveau Premier, ta-da, which is being called, whoops, you don't want to see my face. The camera does, but you don't. All right, where is it? Come on, focus on me. So this is called Tequila Sunrise. So this is the first kind of like fading, multicolor, ombre-ish kind of thing that we've done. It's really hard in a premiere to do any type of multicolor thing like this. Usually we do swirls and whatnot. Um, we haven't done a lot of quartzy type patterns. So this is a pretty exciting pen for us. Um, it's got gold trim, which we've not done a lot of gold trim pens with a two-tone nib um, with the gold in, which means that the inner part is gold and then it's got like a little outer silver trim here. Uh, and then, uh, you know, it's just, uh, it's kind of a cool pen. So um, the pattern, the color is gonna look a little bit different from one pen to another. And we tried to photograph it in such a way that we would show you a representation. That's always tricky with pens like this uh, to do that. It's kind of an art form in and of itself. But anyway, those are available now. I don't know if any are gonna be available by the time this publishes because I think we're launching them on Thursday, but we will see. We're supposed to get a follow-up order on um, next week. So hopefully it won't be quite as much. I know we've had some stuff stocking issues with seasonal premieres. Um, like last season's was like, we had it for a few days practically. Um, but we've been working with Edison. They've been getting up some new machinery and stuff like that, trying to ramp up production a little bit. So hopefully that should start to smooth things over. We shall see. Uh, what else we got? Oh yeah. Uh, how about some new gin house? So we, you know, we carry pens of all price ranges, of course, and uh, it's always fun to dream about four and $800 pens, but how often do you get a sub $4 pen? Not all that often, but we have one here with a Jin House Shark. So these things are pretty cool. Rachel and I talked about them right now on Wednesday. So you can see it's kind of goofing around with these. This is a blue one, uh, but we got a few more colors and then we're gonna have more colors that we've got on order. Uh, basically, we're gonna carry the full range. We, we got high qu minimum quantities on these, but you know, they're just so cool. We think they're gonna be pretty popular, so. It's got an extra fine hooded nib on it. And the extra fine is probably more of a European extra fine than it is a, a you know, Asian extra fine. So it's, um, you know, it's, it's still pretty fine. It's finer than any other Jin Hao that we have. So I think it'll be pretty exciting. Comes with a converter too. It's like four bucks, come on. Um, and then we got two other Jin Hao's that we're gonna have next week. One of which is the Shell, um, which is like a kind of a poor person's rotten. <laughs> Frankly, it really kind of looks like that. It's got kind of this block pattern. Um, it's a smaller pen than some of the other, like thinner pen than some of the other Jin Hao's that we have. Um, and it's got a fine nib, which actually is as fine, if not a little bit finer than the extra fine on the Shark. It's a whole different nib, but anyway, so if you'd like a finer nib on kind of a more conventional fountain pen, um, this one is gonna be sub $20. So uh, definitely worth check out with a converter. Uh, and then, of course, we have the epic one, which is the Dragon, which is one of my favorites that we are picking up here. I mean, this sucker is three-dimensional. It is uh, epic. I don't know other, any other way to say it. The Dragon, two dragons wrapping around each part of the pen with these kind of like ruby red eyes that they are like staring each other down on the pen. It's pretty darn cool. It's a huge heavy pen. Very much this kind of like Montegrappa-esque uh, limited, you know, kind of over the top thing. Think about like the pirate pen or the chaos or something. Um, has kind of that like just really three dimensional, like how the heck would you practically write with this pen? Uh, I've been I've been doing some, you know, written thank you notes with this pen. Uh, of course with Diamine Red Dragon, cause what else? And uh, it actually is not so bad. <laughs> you know, I don't know that it's, necessarily gonna be the pen that everybody grabs first to go to their next business meeting, unless maybe you're trying to send a specific type of signal. But certainly if you were into any type of like role-playing gamery or uh, any type of like, you know, nerd-tastic type of activities, uh, this would be a pretty sweet pen to bring along. And that one will be just under 30 bucks. So not too bad, just pure like, you know, by the weight of it. It's not a bad, not a bad price per gram uh, on the pen there. So that one's coming next week as well. And then um, a couple other things of note. So we have uh, the Pelican is coming out with their M1000 uh, limited edition. This is a Machier pen, which they usually do one every year. Uh, and this is one is called Peacock. There are not very many in the US and we got our hands on one. So we'll have that on our website very, very soon, if not already by the time this video publishes. Um, uh, we were very fortunate to even be able to get one medium nib only, but if you're interested in that, 
uh, we will have one. So you can, you know, ask. I can't even show it to you because we leave it completely intact in the box because sometimes collectors want it to be completely pristine, never open. So that's the way that we leave it um, for pens in that kind of price range. So uh, if you're interested in that, we will have one. And then uh, Retro 51, so those are on our website now, the roller balls. Um, so they are re-outfitting their fountain pens um, with a new and improved grip, and they're switching over to Yovo nibs. So they're kind of stepping up their fountain pen game, but they're not quite ready yet. So they have roller balls just kind of like ready to go. And we've talked about them and right now, um, you know, several weeks ago, and they seem to be pretty well received, pretty popular. So we're gonna just kind of ease into it and start carrying the um, regularly offered, you know, selection of the regularly offered uh, roller balls, um, just to kind of ease into the brand, uh, and, you know, introduce it to you all, kind of familiarize you with it a little bit, uh, and then we're gonna do, start doing some uh, more interesting things, I shall say. We may or may not have some um, special things in the works on that. No details to be shared quite yet, but let me just say, it's gonna be cool. All right, um, we're gonna have the Aurora Optima Flex in yellow really soon. Don't have a specific date. I thought it was coming this week, but maybe not, I'm not sure. So be on the lookout for that. Um, and then the Visconti Homo Sapiens Bronze Swirl. So this is another special Homo Sapiens, just like the Chianti Shire, just like the London Fog. Um, very much like a mocha kind of uh, uh, thing. I think they could have totally named it like a coffee themed thing, but they went with Bronze Swirl and that's totally fine because that's the official name. Uh, so we will have that really, really soon. I'm a big fan of the Homo Sapiens. That's actually, I carry one of the lava ones with me. It's basically my daily carry pen that I keep on me at all times which I absolutely love that pen. Um, I'm also a big fan of the resin versions uh, of the Homo sapiens as well, because it's clear, you can see the ink sloshing around in there, um, beautiful colors, and uh, the hook safe lock, the cap on that thing, mm. Like it's pretty good on the lava, it has a little bit of resistance to it, but on the, like, you know, on the Divina, on the, um, you know, the Medici and the other, you know, the other, and, the, and all the special Homo sapiens, it just like, ooh, feels like butter. So big fan of that. Um, and so that'll be coming out really soon. Uh, the Aurora 888 Urano, which is this gorgeous 888, they call it 888, but it's the 88, you know, model basically. Um, Urano, it's like this turquoise flecked kind of pattern. We got seriously shorted on these. I think the whole US got seriously shorted on these. So they're going to be in super short supply. I apologize. If you really had your heart set on that pen, you're gonna have a hard time getting it wherever it is and try to snatch it up when you can. Um, we got so seriously shorted in our first batch, we were like, we can't even launch these. I'm not joking, it's like, practic we got practically none. Um, so we we're waiting to try to get like a little bit more and then it's gonna be like, we're gonna do one launch and they're gonna be gone. I can just tell you they're gonna be gone immediately. So if you're on the lookout for that, really be ready to pounce once we get those in. Uh, and then Opus 88, the Picnic uh, pen, is gonna be coming out in purple. So expect that really soon. I don't know exactly when, but it's coming. Uh, Jay Urban is coming out with five new inks in their regular line series. And uh, I just realized that my audio is not on. Andy, I apologize, but I just now turned on the audio. So you are probably using the audio that's in the camera. Sorry, everybody, if the audio just changed. That was totally my bad. I forgot to turn on the mic. Anyway, so Jerbon has five new inks that are gonna be coming out. These are gonna be in their regular line um, and I don't have a lot of experience with them yet. I think I've seen what some of them are, like samples of them, and they seem to be pretty cool. Like pretty saturated colors, um, very interesting. So uh, I'm excited for those to come. Um, and then we are gonna have uh, a new line of inks uh, Kyoto. So um, anybody who's familiar with uh, with that, we teased it a little bit, I think back in February maybe, on right now. And we've had so much going on, we haven't picked it up yet, but we are going to. So um, that might be next week, it might be the week after, I'm not 100% sure. You can tell we got kind of like a backlog of a lot of things that are going on right now. So uh, be ready for those to come. Uh, but we're gonna work through all that stuff. Um, and then there's lots more stuff too, uh, but it's so like non-specific as to when it's coming. I don't wanna hype it up for you quite yet, but I will be sure to talk about things as they come. Lots of good things happening here in June. All right, let's get to the questions this week, shall we? Pen and writing questions, starting off with Vazmuth on Twitter. What, in your opinion, has been the most novel or surprising material used for a fountain pen? Are there any materials that you want to see more fountain pens being made from? 
Uh, I've definitely seen some cool stuff. You know, um, a lot of the commercial manufacturers will make some pretty interesting things. Of course, when you're talking about having to more or less mass produce something, um, which in the fountain pen world is like less mass produced than probably most mass produced things in the world, but still, um, you know, you're talking about like having to produce, you know, maybe thousands of something as opposed to dozens of something, um, you know, you, you have to really take your material into consideration. You know, being that I had sort of a custom pen making background, um, there were some materials that I worked with that were just one-offs and I might have gotten lucky and made a pen out of it, but if I had to produce it commercially, it would have been a huge pain. Um, so there's always going to be a more limited selection and kind of the more commercially available stuff. So. I'm assuming that's kind of like where you want to go is like, hey, if something that can be readily available, what are some of the interesting things? So, you know, I've certainly seen some interesting stuff. I'm a huge fan of the Homo sapiens. It's made out of lava. That's pretty freaking cool, you know? So um, it's lava rock in resin. So it's like powdered. Basically, they bust up the rock, make it into a powder, cast it into resin. Um, and that's what the Homo sapiens is made out of. That's pretty darn cool. Whenever I go somewhere and I'm talking to people about pens, it might be other business people. If I go to like a business networking type event, they're usually like, oh, fountain pens. Okay, I guess that's kind of interesting. And I kind of show them what it is. And they're like, what's an example of a cool fountain pen? I'm like, well, this one's made out of volcanic rock. And they're like, whoa. So that's, that's kind of one of my go-tos um, there for people that don't know pens uh, quite so well, but they, they understand what volcanoes are. So that's pretty cool. Um, so lots of other cool materials, you know, carbon fiber. I've seen ones made out of like ancient quarry wood that's like 40,000 years old. That's pretty darn cool. Um, celluloid is in itself a really cool material. Uh, these days, I think celluloid has been around a little bit. Some people may have heard of it or don't really know that much about it or how it's made. It's actually a really cool material um, and really hard to make. But uh, that one's really cool. Uh, anything you're with Yurushi lacquer, that's not so much like what a pen is made out of material wise, it's more of a coating and, and a design element, but just stuff like that. You see that somewhat more commonly. Um, but some of the most interesting things that I've ever seen come from independent craftspeople because, you know, kind of like I mentioned a second ago, uh, you can make stuff that's commercially very inefficient <laughs> uh, and just kind of make them in one-offs kind of for experimentation purposes. And that's where you can really see people kind of playing around doing some goofy stuff. Um, so back in my pen making days, I used to be on this forum called the International Association of Pen Turners, penturners.org. You can head over there and check it out. I think I'm actually there under Goulet Pens. I had to like reset my password because I tried to log in the other day. I totally didn't even have my password anywhere. So I log back in. If you go dig around, you can see some of the old Brian Goulet posts from like 10 years ago on there probably. Um, so anyway, they're nice people over there, I guess. Um, I haven't talked to them in like 10 years, but they, they seem nice enough and the forum still there. It looks exactly the same as it did 10 years ago. Um, but anyway, so there was, you know, back then I was super active on that forum and I saw, you know, a lot of independent pen makers making things out of like antler and, and different animal horn and stuff like that. Um, various types of like stone and polymer clay and just really other like interesting natural materials. Um, one of the most interesting ones that I saw that I really kind of got into is called, they called it worthless wood casting. I don't know if that's a, uh, a trademark term or anything that that was commonly talked about on the forum. It's basically where you have like, you know, um, wood root and, uh, and you know, like gnarled up burls and, and root balls and stuff like that that just had holes in it and was like half decayed and stuff like that. Um, you'd stabilize it and then you'd inject resin into it. You could dye the resin different colors and stuff like that. Uh, and then you could cast it into a single block, turn it, and then make it into a pen form. So you had this kind of swirl of this like knotted wood and uh, resin material. And I made a couple of pens like that out of the day. I don't really have them anymore because back then I had to sell everything I possibly could to try and you know, get my business off the ground. Um, but I did make some of that kind of stuff. I saw people make pens out of like old circuit boards. They would like heat up the circuit boards, wrap them around the pen, cast them in resin. And so you literally had like circuit board pens. I saw people do things out of watch parts, taking like wood and metal shavings and various things like scotch bright pads and steel wool and all kinds of crazy stuff, uh, casting into resins. And I saw some really interesting stuff. But I think the one that takes the cake for me um, it has to be, you know, one of the, uh, you know, we would get into these little, these little threads on the forum of, you know, people trying to cast different things into resin. And uh, somebody, you know, theorized uh, if they could take, and this is going to sound kind of gross because it was, but they took um, cat poop and they, um, they actually like kind of dehydrated it, cast it into resin, and they, they made a pen 
out of cat poop. Uh, and they posted pictures of it. I tried to find it so that I could maybe like share a link to it. I couldn't find it. Maybe it's just too old on the forum, but I very specifically remember that one would have to be the most surprising material I made. Now, truth be told, that one wasn't a fountain pen. It very easily could have been made into a fountain pen, which is why I'm kind of slipping it in here. Um, actually, I don't remember if it was a fountain pen or not. It probably wasn't because most of the people on that forum are, are making rollerballs and stuff, but um, Either way, I think it qualifies uh, as the most surprising material I've ever seen. And, uh, you know, surprisingly, it didn't look half bad, but it definitely looked like cat poop. So, um, you know, it's, I don't know anyone that would want to hold that pen or carry it around, but sh sure enough, it was there. So, you know, the wooden resin combos, I think, are probably most, most captivating for me. I just really love that style. Um, but anyway, those are really like difficult to work with and, and all that kind of stuff. So a lot of these, these really exotic materials, you're just not going to see them available in most pens because they're either hard to work with or they're not very stable in pen form. Um, but uh, it's still really interesting to see like what innovations are kind of coming out there and what pen people are working on. Um, so yeah, that's that, that would have to do it for me. All right, Jen M on Facebook says, I really love the shape and look of the Visconti Vertigo. It's like a poor man's opera master. <laughs> However, I haven't heard much about it and would be curious to see it featured in a right now or a quick feature with your input on the writing experience on Q&A. The pen is just expensive enough that I don't feel comfortable buying it without a little more info. That's fair enough, Jen. I totally get where you're coming from. Um, actually, we are going to be working on um, kind of reworking our format for some longer form video reviews because we haven't done one of those in a really long time. And part of that is because it takes a really long time to make and frankly, I just don't have a lot of time for the, these days. So we used to do like quick look videos and um, you know, Andy's been doing some cool snapshots which are like one or two minutes that show just some of the features of the pen. Um, but we wanna try to find a new video style that incorporates some like assessment, excuse me, of how the pen writes into the video format. And so Andy and I are gonna be working together on that. Colin's gonna be helping out. So Colin might help prep together like some of the raw facts and pull stuff off the product page on the website. I'll spend time learning the pens and then like adding in a lot of my thoughts. And then Andy and I'll work together on like a multi-cam kind of shoot so that we can have like overhead shots and some various things cutting back and forth. So we got some experimentation to do there um, and we're gonna take the next few weeks. We just had a meeting about it earlier this week actually. We're gonna take the next few weeks to like figure out what exactly that looks like but I'm, I'm hopeful that we'll be able to find something. Um, and the one that we've kind of slated as our first project is the Vertigo. So not to put uh, any of those, any of us into a box here, but uh, that is what we're gonna be working on um, for the next few weeks. So hopefully maybe in the next month or so, we will have a nice format down and something specifically on the Vertigo. But before that happens, I can at least talk about it a little bit here because um, I'm here. So the Vertigo, it is kind of like a, I wouldn't call it a poor man's opera master, but it's a, it's a smaller, less expensive version of an Opera Master of sorts. So I have an Opera Master here. So this is the Visconti Opera Master Luna, which is a Goulet exclusive and which is why I'm shamelessly plugging it here because I'm super proud of this pen. And then um, we have the Vertigo, which I'm gonna show you. I grabbed the orange and the blue one and I'm gonna show the orange one because it looks more different than Luna. So you can see right here next to it, it really is kind of like a mini, uh, Opera Master, you know, um, it's very similar, uh, sort of in in size and somewhat in style to the uh, Visconti Opera, which I have um, a pen that is more of the opera size. I don't know if this pen is actually technically an opera, but it's the Wall Street, the original Wall Street pen, uh, and this one is more in the opera size. So if you have an older Visconti Opera, it's not a style that they've done recently, um, but it's that size. You know, and then the, the nib on this particular Wall Street was actually the size of what's on the Opera Master, so it's a little bit bigger. So this is, uh, the one that's on the Vertigo is, is closer to like a number five size. And then the one that's on the Vertigo, sorry, the one that's on the Opera Master is of course the full size. So I'll show you um, without the cap onto it. There you go, the difference between the Opera Master and the Vertigo. So, um, you know, overall, very similar in, in the look and the style. It doesn't have an ink window, so that is one difference because um, this uh, Opera Master is a double reservoir power filler, and this one is a cartridge converter. So, um, you know, the filling mechanism is one little bit of a compromise there. But honestly, for my, for my use, I actually like 
cartridge converters uh, a lot because I can change ink colors in them a lot. And because of the way that this nib writes, I actually find that it's really fun to experiment with lots of different colors because it's a really smooth writing nib. So the nib is one thing I got to talk about with this, this uh, Vertigo. Um, and it's kind of interesting in its styling. So it is a stainless steel nib, but it has this like gold overlay um, that is kind of interesting. It's not a two-tone nib per se, and it's not just like a gold plating over top, but it's actually like three-dimensional kind of this gold pattern that's overlaid over the top. Now, if you recall um, from, you know, probably three, four, five years ago, Delta came out with a pen called the Fusion 82. And uh, I actually, it was like a, the Delta Fusion nib. 82 was one of the models that had it, I guess. But it was a Delta Fusion nib. And actually, I was thinking I should grab that because it's kind of interesting. Okay, so this is the Delta Fusion 82. And so the Delta Fusion nib, um, you know, kind of a different look, but a somewhat of a similar concept. So it's got a gold overlay over top of a stainless steel nib. And it was meant to be kind of a hybrid nib. It was uh, sort of in between, price-wise, in between their steel and their gold nib. And that's kind of what Visconti's got going on here with the um, this what they're calling the Precision Touch nib. So they have their Dream Touch, they have their um, um, Smart Touch, and then they have their Precision, precision Touch, which is now uh, this new one. So does the gold actually do anything different to the nib? I don't know. You know, Delta, when they were touting it, they had like patents and stuff that said that like the interaction between the gold and the steel caused like some kind of chemical reaction that allowed the ink flow smoother. I don't know whether that's scientifically the case. It definitely stirred up some controversy back in the day with Delta. Um, I don't think that Visconti's leaning too hard into that uh, as, you know, what is going on with this nib, but I'm sure it might come up a little bit for those of you who remember the Delta thing. So I'm just kind of trying to get ahead of that a little bit. So I don't know whether it actually makes that much of a difference in terms of like this, these little lines of gold that are on here. Is it, is it making your ink flow smoother? I would have a hard time saying like, you betcha, but I will say the nib does write really nicely. Um, I don't have a good way to show it here in Q&A, but I did do writing samples of all of them in the nib nook. Um, and all I've written with is Noodler's Black, which is something I've written with every nib that we've ever carried here at Goulet in our nib nook tool. So I did write with this, and as I was writing with it, I was like, huh. This is actually a really smooth writing pen. The flow is really consistent. It's not a flexible nib at all. So you're, it's not as bouncy as what you're gonna get with a palladium nib. That is sort of your compromise. Um, but I personally, I don't feel like you have to have everything bouncy. As long as it writes smooth and the ink flows really nicely, you know, that's kind of okay. So um, keeping that in mind, I think that this is a really nice writing nib. It feels a little different than the full-size Opera Master. But in terms of using it as somewhat more of like a daily writer, it's actually pretty practical because it's it's smaller in size, it's lighter in weight, it's 40 grams as the whole pen, and some of that is in the actual cap. So the body of the pen is, is very reasonable in its weight. So it's gonna be more comfortable for people um, than probably the Opera Master would be for most people. The Opera Master is a pretty large, pretty heavy pen. It's a 60 gram pen total. So it's two thirds the weight of an Opera Master. So, and it's, you know, basically half the price. Uh, maybe even a little less actually. So it's a it's a pretty cool pen, still up there in price. You know, you're pushing that $400 range there. Um, it's 475 MSRP and you can log in to gouletpens.com to see your best price. But um, it's, uh, it's a really well-crafted pen. Like the, the shape of it's really cool. And uh, one thing that's kind of interesting about this, it's subtle and it's hard to sort of see the difference. Um, but I'll do my best to show you. So on the Opera Master, it has what they call the squared circle. So the pen is a general square shape, and then the corners are kind of rounded. Um, and that's a really cool design. It's unique to Visconti. Um, but they have something, uh, kind of a variation of that with the Vertigo. So if you look, you can see at the end of the Opera Master, the big one, that's a square. It's also a square on the Vertigo, but it kind of is, uh, almost looks more like a diamond 
which I realize a square and a diamond is just a square that's turned a few degrees, but um, it's square in the middle here, and then it actually tapers, each facet tapers, so that it ends up being a diamond. So when you look at it, you're like, oh yeah, it's just a square, and you're like, wait a minute, that square is actually turned a little bit. And it does that both on the top and on the bottom finial. So when you go, it's, it's a magnetic cap too, which is also cool, Opera Master threaded. Um, when you seat it on the pen, it can wig you out a little bit. And if you're a little OCD, this may be the deal breaker for you. Um, but because that facet kind of ends up twisting that square, when you seat the cap onto the pen, um, it's not going to, the clip is not going to line up exactly in its posted position with the nib. You can see it's actually kind of to the side a little bit. Do you see what I'm talking about there? So you have the nib, the nib is in line with the facet, but the cap, you can't post it on the back to be exactly square with the nib. See that? It's gonna be, yeah, see there? It's turned to the side a little bit. So that might wig you out a little bit, but then of course when you post the cap uh, back onto, it's, you know, not posting, but when you cap the pen, it's gonna be in good shape again. So anyway, hopefully that gives you a little bit better of an idea. I know I only talked about how the pen wrote, but that's what I hope to show in the next video that we do. Um, it's a pretty cool pen. I know it's kind of new and interesting, which is why I wanna do more of a full form video on it. Um, not the ideal format here in Q and A, but um, I think it's still an interesting pen. I think Visconti's trying some new stuff, trying out some new nibs, which is kind of cool, and I gotta commend them for that. And I think over time, this will be, um, you know, one that I think people will uh, respond to. Cool. All right, let's talk about ink, shall we? This is from Narindil on Instagram. How can I tell the difference between a fast drying wet ink and a slow drying dry ink? Fast drying wet ink and a slow drying dry ink. Um, is there a difference at all that's uh, gonna be kind of subjective because all these terms are fairly subjective when we're talking about pens. Um, in my view, I would consider a fast drying wet ink to be uh, what I'd call most fast dry inks. Uh, things like Noodler's Bernanke, maybe the Diatrementis Document inks. Private Reserve had some fast dry inks for a minute. And um, I think that uh, what you typically see with those is the ink kind of gushes out of the pen, like it, it doesn't it doesn't write dry. It's not stingy in its flow. It flows out of the pen really uh, generously. But then uh, part of the reason it does that is because um, uh, of the properties that are in the ink that also allow it to saturate quickly into the paper. So you tend, with those types of inks, you tend to get a little bit more spread. You don't get as much shading, um, maybe a little more bleed through sometimes, it can depend. Um, but it comes out generously, it's, it's a dark kind of thick line um, and absorbs in the paper, paper, paper quickly and it doesn't dry, or sorry, it doesn't smear, which is why it's considered a fast dry ink. A lot of people think, you know, if it's fast dry, it should like dry up in the pen and not flow out that, that wet. Um, but it's actually, it flows out of the pen very quickly and then absorbs into the paper quickly so that on the surface where you would smear it, um, it's not going to feel like that. That's what I would consider to be what you're talking here, the fast drying wet ink. Um, now the other side of it that you had is a slow drying dry ink. Um, might be some of the more of the like heavy, heavy shimmering inks maybe. Um, it's like really saturated in color. Maybe it doesn't gush out of the pen, but it kind of like sits on top of the page after you write for a little while. And it can smear a little bit because um, there's either so much dye in it um, and not as much lubricant, or there's like particulate or some other sort of component to the ink that gives it an intense sheen or an intense shimmering. Um, those can sometimes feel a little drier in the nib. Um, and especially if you're using finer nibs, like on the shimmering inks and stuff like that. But then on the page, it may be more inclined to smear after a little while. So it can, can be considered a slower drying ink. Um, you know, many of the dry writing inks that I'm thinking of right now aren't necessarily slow drying, like the dry writing ink, sorry, is not necessarily slow drying. Um, those may be a little more rare. Uh, I feel like most of the properties that cause pens to write dry might also help them dry faster on the page. But those were that was kind of the ones that I could think about. So uh, anyway, thanks for the question. It prompted me to think a little bit about some ink properties. Also made me realize just like how completely subjective all this stuff is because I'm like, dang, there's like no 
solid information on a lot of this stuff. It's completely up to like pen reviewers to just like guess uh, about all this stuff. So that's kind of constantly on my mind is like, how can we be more objective about this kind of stuff? But I have no answer for you on that right now. So you just get a whole bunch of opinions out of my mouth. All right. Next question is from Crystal Morrissey on Instagram. I'm super new to fountain pens. I have a Lamy Safari one month and a Pilot Metropolitan three days. <laughs> I use Loistrom 1917 to bullet journal in daily. And as much as I love these pens, I'm losing my mind uh, with ink bleeding and trying to find a highlighter I can use with them. As much as I'm excited to slowly dive in and learn, I need a short-term solution. I've already tried dry highlighters. What is the next best step? Waterproof ink, any recommendations? Thanks. Okay, um, waterproofing can help. It's gonna depend on what it is that you're using, especially if you're having a bleed through problem, you may need to um, experiment a little bit. Um, you know, Leuchtturm notebooks are pretty darn good, but it depends on what nib you're using. I didn't, you didn't specifically say what nib. If you're using a, a broader nib, it's gonna put more ink down on the page. You might get some more bleed through and stuff like that. So try and go with the finest nibs possible. Um, the Metropolitan, you'll probably have a little better luck. I know you've only been using it three days, but um, you might have a little better luck because they grind their nibs a little finer than Lamy does. Um, so you will be putting less ink down on the page just right off the bat by um, using that pen. Um, so um, one ink that you could try would be Platinum Carbon Black. So I know a lot of bullet journals like to use things like fine liners and um, felt tip things and various, various Faber-Castell uh, pens like that. Um, but uh, um, Platinum Carbon Black, it's a pigmented ink. So it actually absorbs less into the page. It dries a little more on the surface. A lot of artists like to use that because um, it's a very waterproof ink. It dries relatively quickly. And it's good for when you need to have like a permanent line and you wanna do like an ink washing or a mixed media art or something over top of it. So it tends to do pretty well uh, when you're in a highlighting type of situation too. The interesting thing about when you're using a highlighter is, you know, you're literally smearing over top of the writing. So if you're, if you're not using ink that's like locked in uh, to the paper, then it's going to smear. And a lot of fountain pen inks are not made to be permanent um, because that's not necessarily their primary goal. It's easier pen maintenance a lot of times to not have a permanent property. So you have to kind of n use specific inks kind of for that purpose. That's the beauty of fountain pens is you can use whatever the heck ink you want. So you can have a pen that you love and then change out the ink for your very specific um, uses that you're looking for. Diatromentous document inks could be another option for you. Those are really permanent too. They might bleed a little bit more. It depends on how it works for you and the nib that you're using. Those tend to soak into the paper just a little bit more. Um, I hear that iron gall inks can work pretty well. Those are a little more maintenance. That might be a little deeper dive than what you're looking for necessarily, but it did come up, especially in a Gooey Nation thread that I saw that came up about inks that work well for highlighting over top of them. Um, iron, certain iron gall inks like the Roaring Klingner, um, Salix and Scabiosa came up, Platinum Classics came up. So um, those might be something to look into. Um, and then Noodlers has some permanent inks that could be good for you. They could be a little hit or miss depending on, um, you know, the, how long you let them sit there before, you know, Leuchtturm paper can be a little bit more absorbent and that's okay, that'll help it dry a little faster. If you have really ink resistant paper, some of the Noodler's permanent inks can take a while to dry because they actually have to like soak in and then bond to the cellulose in the paper. They're cellulose reactive permanent inks. Um, so I heard of success with Heart of Darkness, which is also a really good, uh, so Noodler's Heart of Darkness, that's also really good for um, the bleed through resistance. So that's kind of a good all around. It'll help in the bleed through, it's a permanent ink, good for highlighting over. Um, I've heard Liberty's Elysium, that's not a fully permanent ink, but you know, some people said that that works well. Noodler's Lexington Gray, that's a gray ink um, that's also permanent and that behaves pretty well, dries fairly fast. Uh, and then one person even said Base Date Blue, and that's not a permanent ink, but they said highlighting over top of it works great. Very bright, vibrant ink. Um, it'd be hard to miss something written in that in your bullet journal. Um, so yeah, uh, another thing that came up uh, was, is, is, and I'm, I'm relying on the community here because I don't do a ton of highlighting over top of my inks. Um, highlighter pencils. So like Faber-Castell apparently has highlighter pencils. Um, you said you use dry highlighters. I don't know if that's different than highlighter pencils or if that's the same thing, um, you know, is one option. I don't sell highlighter pencils, but uh, it might be something worth investigating. Um, now some other suggestions that said, uh, people said highlight underneath the word instead of over top of it, um, kind of underlining with the highlighter instead maybe. Um, and some people also say that that's a good practice because if you're trying to photocopy, maybe not your situation with bullet journaling, but if you're trying to photocopy, 
whatever it is that you've highlighted underneath, um, you know, sometimes the highlighter can, can interact with the photocopy and you may not want that. Um, it can look too dark and it'd be hard to read. Um, so it could be an advantage that would help in that way. Um, and then other people say specifically they kind of highlighted in bullet journaling, they highlighted, huh? They pointed out that when using their highlighter specifically for bullet journaling, um, it's like, you know, the particular day or month or whatever, um, that they actually do the highlighter first and then they write in over top of it, whatever it is. So that might also be an option for you. And then you wouldn't have to worry quite as much about all this other stuff. Uh, if you do the highlighter first, then you're writing over top and you're not gonna smear whatever you wrote. So um, lots of good things here, some experimentation, maybe giving you some ideas to think about. Um, uh, I've got a, I'll, I'll try to put a link to the, to the description of the, th sorry, link to the thread um, for the Goulet Nation um, you know, thread that came up. Um, it's a private Facebook group, but if you wanna join in there, it, you know, so we'll let you in. Um, so there, there you go. A little bit, little bit about highlighters for you. All right. Next question we've got. This is a business question from Hypertext on Instagram. I know you guys do special orders for things you could carry but don't keep in stock, but I've never heard you talk about how to go about special ordering or what all information you need to special order products. What's the process and pricing? Is it about 20% off MSRP like the ones you do stock or is it full MSRP on special orders? And is there anywhere you know to find US product catalogs with marked suggested retail prices? I found the list of Penn's Platinum carries in the US on one of their sites for instance, but it doesn't include prices. Okay, so special orders. Um, we've done special orders before, um, but we do not do them consistently and we are not doing them right now. Um, basically, we're in a holding pattern on them because uh, the truth is they're always more complicated than they seem and they almost never go smoothly. Um, every time that we um, you know, we get asked about them whenever we aren't offering them and then when we kind of open that door a little bit, it kind of, we always kind of regret it just because we have the best of intentions when doing special orders, but there are almost always logistics outside of our control that keep it from being a smooth and pleasant experience for anyone involved. Um, so it's hard for our distributors because they never know what it is that we're gonna come at with them. Um, a lot of times we get asked about things that haven't been available in a long time that aren't imported into the US at all, so we can't get them anyway. Um, you know, it might be things that we don't regularly stock, so we don't know that much about them. Them, especially if it's like a different format, like a rollerball or a pencil or something like that, we really have to trust that you as a customer would know exactly what you're looking for. And then we, we can't provide nearly the same level of service and education that we would if it's not something that we are familiar with and, and stock regularly. Um, you know, and then it can also be tough because it might not be something, it might be something that's sort of regularly carried, but the distributor's out of stock of. So we have to always go through this big inquiry process with every single thing. And, and you know, you're right, there is no like universal standard pricing out there for every single pen product that's available. Every brand is different. You know, a lot of them, they will change the prices. So there's no like one site that has MSRP prices of everything because I'm not joking, like some of the pricing catalogs, um, you know, are just so insanely long. It would be so incredibly confusing for you. It's amazing. Like Claire Fontaine, for example, just that's a notebook company. Claire Fontaine, their catalog is about this thick. So just imagine if they had, I mean, they have a website um, that's like a B2B type website that has that information, but it's entirely overwhelming. And for you as kind of a casual consumer, if you will, to try to go through even one company's entire catalog of every product, every price, it's completely overwhelming. So you end up kind of hunting and pecking and, and trying to get this information. And because it's so hard to keep it updated and keep it clear, uh, manufacturers just don't bother. That's why there are retailers, you know, because we specialize and we get to know certain products and we can provide that great level of service that you all know. Um, it can be very overwhelming to just kind of blast all that information out there. Um, so, you know, if we get an inquiry, you know, then we reach out to the distributor and we say, hey, there's this thing that we don't regularly carry. Do you guys have any of these on the shelf? And like half the time they're like, no, we don't have any, or we've got some on order, but we don't know when they're gonna come in. They may or may not be being made. It might be a month, it might be three months. We just don't really know. And so then we're left communicating back like, well, they, they have them, but it might be who knows how long. And we don't really like, want to take somebody's money and hold on to it if it might be one or three or whatever months. Um, the kicker is one time we, we you know, 
we promised someone a special order and then we waited, I think like six or eight months. And eventually we just reached out to them proactively and said, look, I'm sorry, we're just going to cancel this because we can't, we can't hold on to a guarantee this long um, for something that we don't even regularly carry. We don't even know what's going on. Um, and it just, it makes for a lot of extra time, a lot of extra work, making promises that we can't necessarily deliver on. And stuff like, there's so many things like that in the process that being really frustrating. Um, and then of course, you know, as far as pricing goes, we have to figure out what the pricing is for ourselves. Um, and then, you know, usually we try to keep it in line uh, or we would try to keep it in line with what, if we were to regularly offer it, we would do it. So we don't like try to charge a premium necessarily for, for a special order. That's not uh, really the way that we go about it. Um, but, you know, obviously with all this time and back and forth, it's like if it's a $20 pen and it's something that we don't regularly carry all this back and forth, it's not economical for us to do that. So, you know, it's, it's, we have to, you know, be intelligent about how we go about that. But even that right now, it's like, we basically have just canned all, all special orders at the moment, you know, at the end of the day, if everything works out perfectly, it can be a great experience. But even then, if there's any problem with the pen, if there's any questions about it's not writing like they expected, or it doesn't look as they expected, we don't really know because we don't stock it regularly how it should be. And then, you know, if we end up in a return situation, then we're left with this pen that we don't stock regularly. And it's just like, no good deed goes unpunished, you know, with these special orders. So it's something that we have done in the past. We always try to do it with the best of intentions. Um, but, you know, as it is right now, it's not something that we can really tackle, um, especially with everything else we've had going on with the website and all that. Um, strategically, we may decide to offer some in the future, no guarantees whatsoever. It's something that we talk about fairly regularly as a team, but it's always just in the back of our mind just how often, I'm not joking, probably 90% of them end up just being a hot mess um, for various reasons. I mean, we've had ones before that we've had somebody wait two months and then it finally comes in and we get the wrong nib size and then we got to send it back to the manufacturer, you know, and it's just like, oh my gosh, this is crazy. So stuff happens, you know, it's all humans in these business. So um, we get it, but we, we like to be able to offer you something that we know we can deliver quickly, reliably, stand behind it. And it's difficult to do that, even for existing brands that we have, um, if we're not stocking it regularly. So that's kind of where we're at. Um, I know it's kind of a womp womp, you know, kind of an answer, but that at least gives you some insight into like the logistics behind what we have to do and maybe gives you at least an explanation of what's going on. All right. Checking my stats. Okay, we're all good. I got one chunk of battery left on the camera and I'm like, oh, am I gonna make it? All right, personal questions. I got two of these and then we're gonna wrap it up. So uh, first one is from DC Gary G on Instagram. Are there any pens that you first disliked that grew on you over time? I really didn't like my Twisby 580 when I first got it. Then months later, I picked it up again and appreciated it. Now it's a daily carry. Well, that's cool. You know, sort of a black swan kind of story for you. Um, I don't, you know, I don't necessarily have like pens that I absolutely hated and now I absolutely love. Um, a lot of pens, I have a pretty good gut instinct for like, yeah, I'm not really a huge fan of that. Um, but I do have some a little bit over time that have grown on me. You know, when the Twisby Eco first came out, um, I was really excited about just the, the pricing and the prospect and stuff like that. The cap really bothered me. You know, it's the hexagonal cap on the Eco. I don't love it. I still don't love it. Um, it was kind of a turnoff for me and I really didn't use it much at first. Um, but it was a kind of scenario where I knew we would get a lot of questions about it. So I kept one personally. I think I kept like a white cap one in broad. I was like, I don't really want to write with this thing. So I'll just keep whatever we have stock of that I know people will want the least. Um, so I kept that. And then I inked it up. I kept it inked up with the same ink for like eight months. And the thing just freaking wrote every time. And so I was like, okay, I don't love the aesthetics of the cap, but dang it, if this isn't a great writer and a phenomenal value. Um, now, basically every color of Eco that's been coming out, I've been keeping one and I'm like, well, daggone, I'm just a freaking Eco collector now. What do you know? Um, but it's a very reliable pen. I'm a huge fan of how it writes. So that might be an example of something that I didn't love because of one aspect of the aesthetics, but the writing kind of turned me around. Um, let's see the next one. Lamy Safari actually was not a huge fan at first. You know, I've also become an accidental collector of safaris. Um, but I really, and especially like when we got into some of the special editions, it was like neon green, neon coral. You know, and it was just like all these greens and yellows and stuff. And I was like, okay, enough of that. Um, but then they started to come out with like the dark lilac, the petrol, the bl all black. And I was like, okay, these matte finishes, 
I'm more into them. I know not everybody loves them, but I like the matte finishes a little better. Um, the more subtle colors are really cool. I think they're probably due for going a little wilder now. They've gone matte for a couple of years and, and dark for a couple of years. Maybe mix it up a little bit, Lamy. Um, just a little hint of a suggestion there. If that matters at all, they're not going to watch this video. Uh, but anyway, so I... Um, you know, that's one that definitely has grown on me. I have this whole freaking Safari collection now. Um, but uh, that one is one that uh, kind of came around on. Uh, let's see here, the Traveler's Pen. So this one, it's a relatively recent acquisition that we've had here. Um, I carry it around on my Traveler's Notebook, which actually fits quite nicely, as you might guess, they make both of these. Um, but it's this little brass pen, and I'm not a huge pocket pen guy. I'm a, I have big hands. I like really thick pens, generally pretty heavy pens. Um, but something about just the portability of this, it's cartridge only, so it's got like a lot of things about it that like on paper, I wouldn't necessarily be like, yeah, sign me up. Um, but I saw that there would be an appeal for this, so I was always on board from the beginning for us to carry this pen. But then once we got it in and I held it and I was like, oh, this thing is solid. And I like brass and copper pens and stuff like that where it gets a lot of character. Like my, my resin pens, like, you know, it's one thing for them to get kind of, sh you know, just um, battle worn, you know, desk worn or whatever, you know, you get the little micro scratches and little dings and stuff like that. And that I'm always kind of like, oh, I try to like polish those up a little bit. But actually when I get like, you know, my, um, you know, copper mule from Monograppa and like the brass pen and stuff like that, I actually like to let them just patina and just, I beat them up a little bit. And, and carry them around a little more rougher. You know, it's like this one I had actually in my pocket next to my pocket knife. And like, I wasn't even thinking about it. I had the blade edge of the knife like up against this thing. So it's like all scratched up on the side here. And then I was like, actually that's kind of cool because it's like, that's my story. That's how I use it. So just like the character this pen has, and then it's actually a very reliable writer. Um, it's a very small pen, but then when you when you post it, um, it does. So I, I actually freaking love this pen now. So this one, I was. No, it's not that I hated it at first. It just wasn't a pen for me. And now I like carry it around with me everywhere I go, just because it's, it's super durable and it's just a. I don't have to think about it. Kind of a pen. I just keep a couple extra cartridges in there, and I'm like, I don't really care what color or whatever it is that I use. It's just a when I need to grab a pen kind of pen. Um, okay, and then the last one that I have, um, this one is interesting. So this wasn't so much that I hated it, it was just like a, what is that? Um, so this is a, a vintage pen called the Alami Lady. Um, so they had a couple different patterns. This is one I affectionately refer to as the Golden Cow. Um, but it's, a, it's actually a really nice pen. It's made of, body's made of porcelain. It's actually a pretty freaking expensive cool pen. Um, it's got this interesting gold nib, which Lamy doesn't make on any of their current pens. So it's a really interesting pen. And, you know, it doesn't have a clip, but it's got these little roll stops. And it's just a really kind of elegant pen, you know, and I don't have an extensive vintage collection. I do have a lot of different Lamy's, but um, just kind of over the years, I've had this pen probably six years, and over time, it's become kind of like one of my more endearing pens that are just like, it's an aspect, like you'd look at me and you wouldn't think like, this guy's carrying a golden cow lady pen around, but I actually really like it. So I don't know, just goes to show that sometimes you just, it's not like most of the other pens that I have, um, but you know, I just like it. I don't know, I have no other explanation for it other than it's just really grown on me, just cause it's so unique. Um, so there you go. Truth be told, I'm a pretty excitable person and I probably end up uh, genuinely liking way too many pens. So there's not really that many that I dislike to start with. Um, I, I'm not joking. I looked through my whole collection of 600 or whatever pens and I was like, I don't really hate any of these. <laughs> So I think it's kind of like, you know, all adopted children where it's like, I love them all equally. That's definitely not true, but you know, I do. I do love pens, what can I say? All right, and to close out this week, this question is from Denise D on Facebook. I'm curious as a small family business owner, do you ever find yourself talking about work at home and or other times? I have to laugh because when do I not? Uh, and other times that are usually reserved for non-business talk. Does it ever seem like the camera and your thoughts about work are always on? How do you keep yourself from seeing something beautiful and not thinking, wow, that'd be an awesome ink color? <laughs> or Goulet should market their own brand of dot, dot, dot. What are your thoughts about paper and pen and ink to leaking into private time and family play time? You know, this is a great question because um, I'm probably in a interesting scenario like this because 
my wife and I work together. So any of you who work with your spouse in any capacity, you know work talk is gonna bleed over into your family talk. You know, just because if you're working in separate places, you would talk about what you have going on at work. Your spouse or significant other would talk about what they have going on in their life, whether it's work, whether it's whatever else activities are going on. You're gonna talk about what's going on each other's days. And if you're both involved in the same things, of course that conversation is gonna come up and you're gonna kinda of talk about those things. Um, you know, that happens a lot. And especially if you're really passionate, you love what you do, you work together all the time, and Rachel and I are just like one of those disgustingly sickening couples that we can spend every minute together and still never get sick of each other. Um, you know, so it's, uh, it's the kind of thing that like just we embrace that, we love that, and we don't sweat too hard about family time, work time, all that kind of stuff. Like we talk about the business in front of our kids. You know, we talk, there's certain things that are more sensitive than others, of course, we do censor ourselves, but um, you know, we do talk about this kind of stuff in family time. You know, I grew up with my parents in a family business and that was pretty darn natural. Others of you who have done the same kind of thing, you know what I'm talking about. So um, there is some of that. There's definitely times where we're like, okay, you know, I'm, I'm really sick of talking about pens now. Can we please talk about something else? And we usually then like talk about the kids for four minutes and then pens come back up. You know, just the kind of thing that you, you can't judge yourself too hard for that kind of stuff. Now, if you're not happy about the conversation and it's genuinely affecting the quality of your relationship, that's maybe a different thing and that's maybe more important the issue i don't think you can look and say you know you should spend x amount of time talking about work and x amount of time talking about non-work family things i think everybody's got to find their own comfort level and their own blend in every relationship about how you communicate with each other Rachel and I probably lean a little heavier on the talking about work stuff, but then we don't follow any sports teams. We don't really travel a lot. We don't really have like specific hobbies and interests. You know, most of the hobbies are like photography of our kids or pens for me. You know, Rachel is doing like programming for our website. I'm doing nib tuning training for our work. You know, it's like a lot of our own hobbies are even like wrapped up in kind of what we do. So it just, it ends up being that just, we're kind of all in, you know, on that kind of stuff. Um, but absolutely we like, our kids are super into My Little Pony and Pokemon and all that kind of stuff. And we try to embrace that and talk about that, you know, and I try to use whatever skills, my own hobbies I can acquire. You know, like my daughter is super into these like LOL surprise dolls, you know, and she like does these little unboxing videos and stuff. I don't have any in public, don't ask, but I gotta tell you that girl scares me how natural she is on camera. I think she's gonna take my job someday, but um, you know, she's into that. And so I'm like, okay. You know, she's super pumped, like we'll, we'll bring her here to work and they'll be like bagging converters and you know, doing like little little kid stuff. Um, and uh, not little kid stuff, but you know, stuff that little kids are capable of doing, work. Um, and, uh, and you know, we'll pay them per piece uh, to do it a couple cents per piece and they'll get really excited about doing it so they can save up and get whatever toy gets them going. Um, and Ellie wants to do these little LOL surprise things. So I'm like, you know, shooting the camera and she's unboxing stuff and all that. And so, you know, it's, it's kind of fluid. You gotta, you gotta constantly be in communication with your entire family about, hey, is work actually disrupting the quality of life or is it enhancing it? Do we enjoy talking about it? Is it unifying for the family? Is it tearing you apart? And nobody can really tell you what's right or wrong. Um, you know, Rachel and I feel like we have a pretty good balance. There's times where it's a little heavier and then we adjust, you know, like when uh, we had our miscarriage and, you know, we took a couple of weeks off and we just kind of had to unplug and didn't really talk about work much. Other times, like when we were launching the website and we're dealing with stuff, it was like, you know, all of our free time was dealing with the website and preparing for that. And then like, you know, a week or so after the website was stable, we were like, all right, we are specifically not going to work tonight. We're gonna leave our computers off. Let's, you know, call my parents. We're gonna have them watch the kids. We'll do a date night, you know, focus on our relationship a little bit. Maybe talk about where we wanna travel this summer and, you know, stuff like that. So you gotta ebb and flow with it, take it day by day and kind of just go. Um, but on the second part of your question about, you know, does, um, 
you know, how do you look at something beautiful and not think about an awesome ink color? Oh, that just happens. Like we full on lean into that. Like we'll go and we'll be talking about like painting our dining room or painting, you know, whatever. And we're like, oh, you know what? Apache sunset would look really cool here or whatever it is. You know what I mean? We totally refer to colors in real life by whatever ink color and it is not unnatural at all. It actually kind of helps because Rachel and I then are like communicating in a language we commonly understand. Um, and that's just kind of how it works out for us. But um, you know, it's just kind of funny how that works. Um, so really you just gotta, you gotta do whatever, whatever, you, whatever works for you and figure out, figure that out. All right. That's it for this week. Uh, my question of the week for this week is, do you ever find yourself referring to things in real life in terms of pen or ink? And do you have any kind of like interesting story around any of that? You know, maybe you remodeled your bathroom and you're like talking in ink colors and your spouse is looking at you like you're crazy, whatever it might be. Um, and then I have a writing prompt for you this week, which is to write a thank you note to a member of your family or maybe a close friend or something um, that they did to you within the last week that really meant a lot to you. Maybe you said a verbal thanks, but actually write out a note and give it to them. And it can be a short note, doesn't really matter, but just write it out and, and see what that does. I think you'll, you'll find it does some pretty cool things for both you and for them. So anyway, that's it for this week. Hope you have a great weekend and a fantastic rest of your next week. Thanks for joining me for number 215. You can check out a lot of stuff I talked about here at goodlypens.com. Be sure to subscribe and like us if you haven't already. Thanks for watching and right on.